Are you following the footprints of Jesus? Good song, good song. Would you stand? It's good to see each of you here this morning. Glad you all got your clock set forward and you made it here on time. I hope you did anyway. <laughs> but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Father, we thank you and we cry out for your blessings today as we worship you in truth and pray that all these things that we do and say will be to your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There shall be showers of blessings. There shall be showers of blessings This is the promise of love There shall be seasons refreshing Sent from the Savior above Showers of blessings Showers of blessings we need Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessings, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound the abundance of rain. Showers of blessings. Showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessings. Send them upon us, O oh Lord. Grant us now a refreshing. Come and now honor your word. Blessings, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessings, oh, that today they might fall. Now, as to God, we're confessing. Now as on Jesus we call, showers of blessings, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. You may be seated. Amen. Showers of blessings. We had plenty of rain the last week, so... But to be an outpouring of showers of blessings, Jesus saves. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing ye I. Echo back the ocean caves, earth shall keep her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it to live an endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Softly through the gloom, when the heart for mercy craves, sing and triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. 
highest hills and deepest caves. This is a song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And as we should always pray for revival, revive us again. Number 295 in your hymnals if you're following along. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise. To the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and hath cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. For I'm communing him this morning. Thank you, Lord.
Good morning. Actually, it's kind of like two meditation hymns there, and my meditation is a little more geared toward the first, or revive us again. I'm going to preface this a little bit, preface this, pardon. Um, I try to make this a not about me. It's not about me, and Tim has covered this before. We want to focus this is about Christ and his, uh, his, his great, uh, well, goodness, I'm sorry, <laughs> sacrifice. Thank you. Good morning. Here at Salem Christian Church, we have an open communion. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, please wait for our ushers to invite you down the outer aisles, or if you need assistance, please motion, and they'll be happy to help you. And return up the center aisle for safety after you've partaken. In 1 Corinthians 11.26, it says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In the army, each soldier is taught about land navigation, knowing your position, the, your direction of travel, your distance to be traveled, your individual specific pace count, which is predetermined. It's a number of steps it takes you to reach 100 meters. You can count just your left foot, so you don't have to be such a big number, or right foot, anyway. Um, and a lensomatic compass, one can, can use dead reckoning to travel a great distance. You're basically in a straight line, so if there's a tree, you kind of have to, you know, you can't walk through it. So anyway, um, the, a good soldier constantly checks his direction of travel as the concern was if you're off to even just one degree over a distance, that one degree can put you far from your target, which is something you don't want you know, when you're in the military. Uh, you're not really lost, but they say you're disoriented. Now the Lord's Supper reminds us that Christ's sacrificial love expressed by his death on the cross is to be the unswerving guide for all who claim him as Lord and Savior, Savior and Lord. This is why he appointed the supper to be observed by his followers in remembrance of him. So when we're navigating life, there are times when we get physically, mentally, and spiritually fatigued, which increases our chance to getting off course. But Christ is that waypoint, that guide that is par parallel to the utmost need of mankind. Please join me in prayer. Father, we humbly come to you today and pray that our actions today are glorify your name and you find pleasing. Lord, as we come to partake of the supper, we thank you for your son and his sacrifice so that we may someday sit by you in that kingdom with many rooms. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Could we all stand for the reading? This morning will be Matthew 24, 4 through 14. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man shall deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to the afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets will rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope and that it gives us in this daily life. Father, we thank you for your son who gave us that sacrifice and paid our price. Be with us, Father, as we go through the rest of this service. Be with Brother Tim as he brings the word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, we're going to dismiss We Worship Children's Church for the younger ones that would like to go and participate in that. Otherwise, turn in your Bibles, if you will. Revelation chapter 6. I am very glad you're here today. I know it's uh, spring forward. I know it's kind of a gray day would have been very tempting to uh, have stayed in bed this morning, but it's good to see you. This service would have been uh, less had you not been here, and so we very much hope you feel loved and welcomed. Uh, having said that, I now will tell you that you've come on a day when the sermon is about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I don't know how that hits you. I feel like uh, it reminds me of uh, back in the Muppets. Uh, I should have had Mark turn the reverb way up loud in the volume when I said, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, I don't know how that hits you if you think, oh, cool. Or if you think, oh, great, another sermon where I'm not going to have a clue what we talked about. Revelation chapter 6. We talked last week about worship. We talked that worship was really basically simply attention and affection. That we give intentionally our attention to focus on the worthiness of our God and Savior and that we have affection. Now, Attention probably implies affection, that if you give your attention to something, you care about it. But that picture of worship in chapters 4 and chapters 5. And I said last week, and I've given thought to this over the week, and I, I'm ill-equipped to put this into words. I talked last week about the real reality that there is a spiritual revealing revelation. Apocalypse means revelation. We've come to think of apocalypse as some cataclysmic end time event. But in, in terms here, apocalypse meant a revealing, a, a, an opening, a looking through a porthole and seeing something. And so when I said last week the real, real, or the real reality, I thought about that this week because the spiritual reality that is an eternal reality 
That's what I meant when I said real reality. But that kind of implies that what we're doing here now isn't real. And if you're going through a time of sorrow, if you're going through a time of pain, if you're going through a time of loss, that's real. And so I don't mean to imply that what you're going through is somehow discounted, doesn't matter, not that big a deal, quit being so obsessed with your life, because that's not. It, it is this spiritual reality that helps us with the current real reality that we're in. Is it temporary? Yes. Yes, it is a season. It is temporary. And so in that sense, compared to the eternal, it does seem lesser, but that is not not to disrespect or to diminish what you're going through in your real life right now. But we have it again as we turn to chapter 6. We have this opening. We have this revealing of a spiritual reality that is going on that we can't see. And so it is different. It is a different experience for us because we can't see it. There is a temptation for us to think, well, it's not real because I can't see it. It's not real because I can't touch it. But this is a reality, a glimpse into the spiritual reality that helps us with our present reality. The real hurts, the real difficulties, the real wants that we have in our life now. Now, four horsemen of the apocalypse are not good guys. Uh, they are the embodiment of suffering, pain, and death that we experience in our real lives. They are not um, uh, anti-heroes. They're not somehow the bad guy but is the main subject. There's nothing good here in these four horsemen. We're going to start verse 1, chapter 6. This is John, right? Remember, we're seeing uh, John is relating to us what he sees next. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, if you just jumped in there with us, you need a little bit of background. You need to understand the, who the lamb was, this lamb that was slain, this lamb that in chapters 4 and 5 was declared as worthy, deserving, um, valuable enough to open the seal. There was this moment, chapters 4 and 5, there was this scene where they looked across heaven and no one was worthy to open the seal. This wax, as we would think of it, wax seal holding closed a document that if it had in olden times the king's uh, signet ring on it, that not just anybody could pop that seal and peek what was inside. It had to be somebody qualified, somebody certified, somebody worthy. And so there is a, a scroll, and it's sealed. And they look across heaven, and no one is worthy. And John begins to cry, and then enter this lamb that was slain, the Lord Jesus, and they begin to cry out and to sing that he is worthy. Now, as we switch... You might say, well, I thought it was a seal, and now it appears to be seven seals. Well, it's a scroll with seven seals, 
but don't get lost in that. The first one is opened, and John sees, verse 2, Before me was a white horse, its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, there are things there, white horse, right? White horse, white hat, good guy, typically, right? We might be tempted. Well, there's a crown. It says it was a uh, a crown. Some of your Bibles, I think, will say, is it royal? Is that what your, some of them will describe it as a royal? I believe that's right. It might be victor. But as you go through there, you might be tempted to look and say, well, he has a weapon, he has a bow, he has a crown, he's on a white horse. Sounds to me like it's Jesus. I think, I think it's not Jesus. I think it is fake Jesus. I think it is, and I use this word, and this may cause your alarms to go off. I think this is the Antichrist. You mean the Antichrist or a Antichrist? I think this is a fake Jesus. The Antichrist word is so loaded and so difficult, but I think this represents false teaching. I think this represents a false savior. Imitation, salvation. And I think that is the first of the four horses that is released upon the world. There is in our day and time such an incredible need for truth. Our world denies that there is such a thing as truth. False teaching leads to false hope. False hope leads to discouragement, to despair, and oftentimes to a turning away. And I think this torment, this temptation, this difficulty that is being released is to distract people from the real Jesus and to diminish the real Jesus by offering a fake. Now, that might happen within the church as people are tempted to diminish or look away from Jesus. That might happen outside of the church as people are uh, uh, look to sources of their own salvation or whichever you would have. But the first one, verses 1 or 2, this white horse, verse 3, when the Lord opened, excuse me, when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Yes, it's imagery. Yes, it's unnatural to us, but the result of that is very familiar. That we live in a world prone to violence, prone to war, even in the lesser sense, prone to conflict, prone to aggression. I mean, every time you want to put something on Facebook, you have to stop and think, who's going to yell at me? You know, who's going to come back, call me a name, and imply something that I never said? We have people who are angry. And maybe you are a person who is quick to anger. Maybe you are a person that sometimes comes back a little too hot, a little too fast. We live in a world that is aggressive, under that, frustrated. We live in a world that loves to argue, that escalates into conflict, escalates into violence. War has been a present reality in the world. Now, we, we can think of that in a military global scale always. When you look at the uh, passage uh, where Paul talks to Timothy about elders, those who would shepherd the Lord's church, he, one of the things he says is that they should not be brawlers, people given to fighting, to brawling. It's so common. There's no such thing as a good action movie without a fight scene. A good Western has to have a fight scene. 
a good detective show. Everything we see conflict. Our heroes are often able to beat other people up, and we are prone to violence. Now, this is a spiritual reality, whether you want to look at it as a demonic uh, source, whether you want to look at it simply as it is pictured here, as a red horse being released when the second seal is broken, but the present reality of war, violence, and anger, confrontation, and aggression, that people are hurt and people lash out because they feel wounded and mistreated. So we have a world full of false teaching. We have a world full of imitation salvation and fake Jesuses. We have a world full of war, violence, anger, brawlers, confrontation, and aggression. And then we come to verse 5. When the Lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Then I heard what sounded like the voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and wine. Lack, want, famine. Now, famine is a reality. It's not our reality, but famine is a constant reality. We're told that there's more than enough food to feed everybody. We're told that it is because of immorality, because of greed, because of dishonesty, that some people suffer from a lack of food. That if everybody played fair, if people weren't greedy, that there is enough. Sometimes there are, we talked about it Wednesday night, we had a very educational lesson on locust Wednesday night, the seven attributes of locusts, the size of locusts, the wingspans of locusts, how far they can travel in a given day, and they're pretty impressive. There are times when pestilence, there are times of drought, there are times when a, uh, a bull weevil or some other kind of beetle or locust or something, famine happens sometimes. And it's a reality in our world all the time, even though we're not experiencing it. But implied here is more than just the need for physical food. Uh, when the Lord Jesus gave the model prayer, he said, give us this day our daily bread. What we have here is people giving up an entire day's wages for a small amount of food. The disproportion in our world that even among those who have a lot, there is a sense of lack. Even among those whom there is no food shortage, we often are short on nutrition. Even among those who have enough, they spend it on the wrong things. There's a lot of priority here. Famine, poverty, rationing, the manna that was given one day at a time so that they would have just enough. And people who are filled with what does not satisfy. This is another present reality in the world that we live in, that famine, unfairness, lack, poverty exist. Verse 7. When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the vo voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades, and following close behind them, oh, excuse me, it was, uh, its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beast of the earth. 
about any Sunday afternoon, especially if it's during a time where sports is lacking. You can almost always find Jason Bourne, one of the movies, or Clint Eastwood in Pale Rider. And I have that as a Sunday school question, how many times you've seen Pale Rider. And I've not seen from start to finish that many times, but if I'm scrolling through the channels and hit Pale Rider, I probably have seen it from that point forward, I don't know how many times. Uh, I may not see the end because I probably fall asleep. But we look at it, it's Clint Eastwood, he's cool, there's this group of people who are being taken advantage of, hardworking people, a little bit greedy at the core, but their poverty, they're being treated uh, unjustly by the rich, powerful, unfair hand of the big guy. And in rides this sort of religious, but not very Christian guy, Clint Eastwood, and he is the wrath of God on these unfair people. Now, we might be tempted to look at that and say, well, you know, I think he's the hero of this movie. Killed a lot of people in this movie, but most of them needed killing. And we might look at it and say, Pale Rider, Clint Eastwood, feels kind of like a hero. That is not the picture here. The word for pale in the Greek is a word for that greenish, sick, yellow color that we would probably associate with infection. The picture here is disease. The picture here is death. It's sword, famine, and plague. It's illness. It's death. And this is being released on creation. This is not a sort of not nice hero, this is the wages of sin and death, the wages of sin and guilt. It's rider named death. Now, there's really nothing positive there. There's nothing for us to look at. It is sickness, it is weakness, it is decline, and it's death. And so we have really oversimplified, but let's keep the main thing, the main thing, the plain thing, the main thing, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We have this occasion. John is witnessing the release of these men, these horses, these riders who are filled with suffering, persecution, hardship, and death. And we would be prone to ask why. We would be prone to ask when. Let's keep reading. Verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord? Holy and true, how long until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? They're looking for justice. Verse 11, then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been, excuse me, brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. That is the picture of persecution. This revealing of the souls of faithful saints who had been persecuted and martyred because of their belief in the word of God and in Jesus the Savior. And they are asking for justice. How long, Lord, until you make things right? How long, Lord, until you bring back fairness and rightness? How long will you tolerate? And that's an Old Testament 
uh, question all throughout the patience of the justice and wrath of God. We see that in uh, Peter's writing where he says God is not slow in keeping his promises as some count slowness, but that he's waiting that as many as possible might come to salvation. The fifth seal there, the persecution, the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and their testimony. The sixth, verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the skies fell to earth uh, as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. The sixth seal, natural disaster, catastrophe, calamity. Now, the last two don't always happen. There's probably always persecution somewhere. There's probably always an earthquake somewhere, but we're not experiencing it. We are constantly in the midst of false teaching, imitation, salvation. We are constantly in the mix with war and anger and confrontation and aggression. We are constantly among people who are lacking the basic things of life. We are constantly among those who are suffering from illness, death, and dying. But there is also persecution and natural disasters. Again, that may stir up a lot of questions in your mind. But here's the question that comes up in the text. Let's start in verse 15 again. So all these things are happening. Then the kings of the earth... The princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? In this picture, in this revealing that John is sharing with us, things have become so horrific. It doesn't matter if you're free, doesn't matter if you're a slave, doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you're poor, educated, uneducated, everybody is running to the mountains, to the caves, to hide. Now, Corbin read for us out of Matthew 24. In our minds, make sure that we're placing that correctly. That's 60 years prior to what John is reading, uh, writing that we are reading. Jesus in Matthew 24 told and he doesn't use the four horsemen of the apocalypse imagery. But what does he say? There'll be false Christs who will come. There will be uh, a lack. There will be natural disasters. There will be persecution. He really lines up. What's being revealed to John is what Jesus foretold 60 years earlier prior to his uh, ascension that these things would be happening in the last days. Now, again, we talked in the first in the overview as we started in uh, Revelation that when is not always the best question when you're studying Revelation. When does this happen on my timeline is not a great question. There are parts of this that might make us think, well, that's back when God kicked Satan out of heaven. There's parts of this that might make us think, oh, that's when sin entered the world with Adam and Eve. Oh, that's when uh, Jesus uh, on the cross died and was buried prior to his resurrection. No, I think this is going to be way off in the someday. The reality is, as we've said all along, this letter was written to real people 
with real lives in a real circumstance, the seven churches of Asia Minor, those people, those people like us, I don't know if they had time change or not, but those people like us had to get up and they attended worship. They had lives they had to produce. They had to supply for their families and they were suffering incredible persecution and it was going to get worse. Somebody might say, well, that's right, because this is all foretelling about the fall of Jerusalem that was coming in their lifetimes, some of them. When they read this scripture, when they read about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, when they read about persecution and famine and earthquakes, I think they would have perceived that as a present reality. I don't think they would have sat back and looked at it prophetically in the sense that, oh, I think he's talking about the end times when Jesus returns again. I think he's talking about the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. They would have looked at this and said, check, check, yes, this is in my life. Yes, I am suffering this very thing. Yes, I believe that horseman has been, re has been released to do this to me and to the ones that I love. Now, how all of that sorts out, again, Wednesday night, our teacher on Wednesday night's been telling us the, about multi-layered fulfillment, that sometimes it has an immediate fulfillment and sometimes it has a layer. Yes, I'm fine with that. But the original readers of this would have seen it as their present reality, that they were enduring false teaching, that they were enduring the lack of peace and aggression in their peace, lack of peace and having aggression in their lives, that they were starving literally and that they were in fear of death and peril of death and that there were martyrs, there were earthquakes, this is a picture of a people who re realize that this lamb who was slain, bloodied and victorious, is going to bring judgment upon the earth. Yes, I know I'm skipping over the first part of chapter 7. No, I don't think the number 144 is a literal exact number. Start in verse 9. Chapter 7, because the revelation is not going to leave them in despair. It is the good news of Jesus Christ. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, 
nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will lead them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Again, we don't want to say that the real reality is in heaven. It is spiritual, it is eternal, it is real, but so is what you and I and other people are going through. The difficulties, the hardships that they're facing, the suffering that comes through faith, uh, fake hope, fake Jesus, imitation, salvation, those who are enduring the ravages of war and anger, famine and lack, decline and death and persecution and natural disasters. Surely that question that comes up in verse 17 is right. In a world like that, with that kind of real evil being unleashed, literally, hell on earth, who can stand? And that's the answer that comes back in chapter 7. Who was worthy in chapter 4 and 5? The Lamb. Who can stand in chapter 6? The answer's in 7. Those who are under the tent of the Lamb who is the shepherd. Those who are in Christ can stand. The real reality being lost is real. Being angry and wounded is real. Being in want and having lack is real. Sickness and death are real. So how do we respond? Because ultimately, we could go through and say, well, I think I understand every little piece of information, and I could match up on, you know, remember those, you had a column and a column, and You'd say, okay, this guy is this guy, and this guy is this guy, and this matches this. And you could go through all of the information and walk out and say, I'm pretty informed. In the reality that we're living in, based on the reality, the spiritual reality that John has shown us, as we walk out from here today, what are our priorities? We need to know and proclaim the truth about Jesus. We live in a world that is lying about Jesus. We live in a world that is lying about the power of other things to save and fulfill you. It's not true. Only Jesus. And we need to boldly proclaim that. We need to know that in our hearts. Second of all, we need to rest. That's what he talked about. We need to rest in Jesus. Why so angry? Is that Dr. Welby? The, you know, why so angry? Why so, why so tense? Well, it's because you had too much caffeine. That's what it used to be. I think that was the commercial. Why so tense? Because I'm afraid. I'm afraid you don't value me. I'm afraid you don't think I'm important. I'm afraid you're going to overlook me. I'm afraid you're going to put me down and that I'm going to get left out. But the gospel says, I can rest in Jesus. Jesus said, I am worth dying for. Jesus said that he loves me. Jesus says that I am enough because he made me enough. And so if you insult me, or if I think you insulted me, or if I wonder if you insulted me, I can rest. I don't have to contend. I can have peace and fullness and joy in who Jesus says I am. And I can be an ambassador of that peace. When people are trying to start a fight, I can throw water on it. I can throw peace at it and just say, I'm not interested. I don't want to do that. We can practice generosity hospitality, and be fearless. It is popular in our day and time. 
with all that we have, with all that we enjoy, it is honorable to pretend that you're poor. Doesn't that drive you nuts? When somebody that you know is loaded pretends like they're poor, and yet to the rest of the world, we're all doing that. We don't fear for our next meal. We don't wonder where we're going to sleep tonight. And as Christians, it is not cute to pretend that we're poor. As Christians, it is not cute to pretend that we don't know if we're going to get by or not. We don't know if our shepherd's going to take care of us or not. We don't know if our father's going to provide for us or not. That's not cute, and it's not funny. There are people starving, literally. There are people doing without. There are people spiritually who are empty and lonely and starving spiritually. And we need to share with them the abundance, yes, material, yes, emotional, in friendship, in hospitality, we need to live without fear and not promote a, a fake sense of scarcity. The last one, people are really sick. People are dying. And we're not good with that. None of us is very comfortable at a funeral. None of us is very comfortable in a hospital room. We're just not sure what to say. And sometimes we'd be better off to not say anything at all. That's a good rule. That just showing up, uh, Job's friends were good till they opened their mouths, right? They showed up, spent three days with him. That was, the, that was their present, was their presence. They opened their mouths when they got in trouble. And sometimes it's just showing up. Sometimes it's just the hug. Sometimes it's just the, I love you. And you don't need to share but we're not good with sickness and death because we're intimidated by it ourselves. But we need to pray. We need to expect. We need to believe. But also we need to believe that God is God and that sometimes healing comes through death. Sometimes complete healing comes through the passing of a loved one. It's not always going to be the way we ask for it. But God is always good. The real real is that life is hard. That there are many temptations. There are many obstacles. And they're not just fate. They're not just happenstance. We have an enemy that is trying to keep a world from finding Jesus. And they are organized. And they are efficient. But we need to be reminded that in our present hurt, in our present difficulty, the Lamb is still on the throne. Let's stand. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this picture, for revealing to us this reality that it isn't that we're unlucky, it isn't that we're lucky, it isn't that uh, fate somehow shined on us, it isn't karma, that you alone are God, that you, Father, are seated on the throne, that the Lamb who was slain is seated there beside you, that our worth and our salvation has been eternally established, and that though our days on earth may be difficult, may be filled with hardship or loss, that we have hope because we have Jesus. I pray, Lord, that even in mourning that we would not mourn as those who have no hope. Father, I pray today that you will encourage us, that your Holy Spirit will give to us meaning and purpose in this message and that in all things Christ may be lifted up, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing.
to 